Okay, thank you. Welcome everybody. Um, I'm excited to dig into talking about the moon today. And I want to come back and just uh, revisit and acknowledge the fact that there is this little tagline on these talks that I've been doing it says using the chart for birthing consciousness series and um, just kind of touch back in with that intention and it explain again the intention behind that. Um, I've been working my way up to talking about the moon because um, I kind of in the, the background of my psyche for a while, there's been some, some deeper understanding formulating around exactly um, what's happening, what's at work throughout the evolution process for us as souls and what it means to evolve here. Um, and the moon just really, I could feel such a key critical part that that was playing in that process that I just, it kind of felt too big that I, I wa wasn't ready to talk about it yet. I've been dancing my way around the, the chart to, to get to the moon. And what's at the heart of it is that there's, um, just as a, as a collective, as a whole on this planet, there's such a big push, there's so much support right now for us to really shift um, as a species and to evolve as a species. And the work that we've been doing on an individual level to, um, with the work with Pluto and our charts to, to do our own personal evolution and generational evolution, um, that's all just speeding up right now. There's just so much extra support right now in us making that shift as a, as a species. And so I've been doing a lot of um, just processing into what, what that shift is and what that collective evolution is and understanding that and bringing, bringing in new energy to this planet, um, getting making so that we're, we're no longer stuck in kind of a 3D expression of ourselves to um, access like such much more dynamic aspects of our being in our bodies. Um, there's so much more in the chart to be revealed to us that astrology can really help us with as well in making the shift and becoming, um, adding so much more dimension to our understanding. Um, as you know, they say that the next shift for us is, is moving into 5D, you know, as a people moving into fifth dimensional energy. And so um, what does that actually look like um, to bring all of that into the body? into our into our beings and how do we evolve in a way that really facilitates and supports that next step for us and it's just um, a matter of being able to hold even greater consciousness in our bodies even greater consciousness and so much more extra awareness and dimension into our physical it's not uh, the the process and the path of ascension isn't about leaving our bodies behind it's not about um, evolving beyond the physical. It's about evolving into the physical with so much more um, and expanding our, our physical body's um, ability to hold an even greater level of consciousness. And so that's just, it's a, it's a profound thing to really um, look at some of the, the tools that are be feeling more and more available to us and to me feeling more available to me to be able to, to really look at that and explain it. And astrology has been helping so much in this um, understanding the process and the gifts that the chart gives us and really stepping into that um, even greater consciousness. So I'll, I'll get into some of this in the, in the talk, but there's um, basically the, when this first started coming to me, when this first started hitting, it was, um, me opening up to this awareness that that the path that we are taking in evolving through the ego um, into some greater aspects of ourselves and me wondering wanting to understand more about the ego is that it's the ego is not a distraction it's not it's not bad it's not the enemy it's a shell um, that acts as somewhat of a surrogate womb for us as we are, there are parts of our essence that, that don't feel like um, we can shine fully here. Once we, as a soul, come into our body, um, into the physical, we meet up against 
all of these limitations and all these limiters and all these karmas, not just personal, but the dense, dense karmas of the planet and the ways that our physical structures here and physical beings have been so repressed and condensed and calcified into being so much less than it can be. Um, physical structures meant to be able to be much more dynamic than it is. You know, I talk about this in my, my Saturn talk. Um, but what it means to bring more consciousness here is this process of helping us to adjust our vibration here to be able to fit into some higher expression. And that's a process that takes time. And, um, and it means working through some of the denser karmas of the planet, some of the denser karmas that our soul has experienced on this planet um, in a way that, um, that acclimates us to being able to hold and express more. Um, so that's just, that's my little touch in. I know that I'm, I'm trying not to get ahead too much because I know I talk about a lot of this stuff, but I just wanted to preempt um, that I feel like that could be a little bit more confusing if I were to leave it there and not go into it more, but I don't want to do a lot of repeating. So we'll just, we'll go forward. Um, so the moon has a really special um, role in helping us to, to really acclimate to this planet um, and the energies of this planet. The moon is so personal. It's the, it's the most personal um, body in our charts. And um, just starting with the glyph, the, the glyphs for each planet is comprised uh, of uh, one or more of the following. So um, the glyphs that make up the, the, or the, the different aspects that make up the symbols are comprised of combinations of either the cross or the circle or the semicircle. And in this case, the, with the moon, the semicircle represents the soul. Um, and the soul, which is that non-material part of a person that is a sum of all experiences gained through life in a physical body. So the way that the soul is represented in the moon glyph um, is comprised of two semicircles, one reflecting the other. So this represents the reflective nature of the moon and the way in which the moon is the soul reflecting on itself. And that's really a critical jumping off point for uh, understanding the, the role that the, that the moon plays. So, um, the moon reflects the light of the sun. That's what it's reflecting in this reflective nature. Well, that's the, the first point of reflection. So the sun is our essence, our essential nature. Uh, the sun is our innocence. From innocence, the sun shines indiscriminately. It shines simply because it is. The sun is experienced as ego. Once we've applied the filters of karma to it, and through these filters, we have translated our essence into a persona. I might have to shift. We'll see what's going to happen with the sun here. So the moon filters the sun's brightness, the brightness being our, our unfiltered essence. Um, and I did a talk on the sun too, and I, I talk about the moon in that talk, and these, these two talks are very much connected to each other, and it's worth watching uh, both of them, and going back and watching the talk on the sun. It explains a lot more about um, the, the sun representing just our, our core essence, um, who we are, our childlike nature, our own personal archetype. Um, so, but the moon is our filters. The filters create our ego. So because of karma and the perception of our innocence being lost, uh, because of outside judgments or threats, or because we're told our essence is unacceptable for one reason or another, we don't feel safe shining our full essence to the world. So through filters, we create the personality, also known as the ego. As we process these karmas and as we heal, we move through these karmic layers one at a time, allowing our soul, our essence, greater expression. So in this way, the layers that we put on through the moon act as a surrogate womb, a container for protecting what does not yet feel safe coming out. Working through these layers in turn, giving the soul more expression in the world is the process of continually birthing more and more of ourselves here from this womb. So the putting on of these layers is symbolized in the crab shell. 
um, cancer being crab, cancer in the moon. It's the shell that the crab develops as a protective response to its early environment. And the crab isn't born with a shell, the crab is born vulnerable. So just like we as uh, souls are born um, onto this planet from a place of innocence, um, completely vulnerable, completely open, we start to encounter um, these oppressive forces outside of us. You know, we are born to parents, bless their souls, you know, um, for better or worse, you know, they, they love us and they project onto us and there's all sorts of experiences that we have via them, but they're, they're not fully conscious beings. You know, there's not many of us that are lucky to be born to completely enlightened parents. So we engage their karmas and we engage in their projections. We're open, we're vulnerable. We are so permeable to all the energies and the frequencies and vibrations around us. It's the, our first taste of some of the harsher uh, densities of these planet, this planet and trying to acclimate and adjust to that. So the process of putting on all of these filters to buffer um, our, our, the way that our essence um, interacts with our environment because it doesn't feel safe. Um, those filters that we put on very much have the flavor of our um, early experiences of our parents, of our mother, it begins in the womb. And so because those filters help to kind of block parts of our, ourselves off so that we can um, so that we can stand, withstand the denser energies of this planet, um, then we're acclimating to be coming denser ourselves. And then the process of then moving through those layers is the process of then birthing ourselves from what would be like a surrogate womb. We come from the womb, we're too vulnerable. We put up all these protective layers to insulate ourselves, acting as a surrogate womb, informing and creating the ego. And then as we move through those layers, we're moving from ego to essence. And that's the evolution. That's the process of us then birthing ourselves. So the moon is subjective. While the sun shines indiscriminately, it is purely objective. The moon is subjective. It is our reflective nature. The moon does not have its own light source as the sun does. It reflects the sun's light. And this reflection changes throughout the month, showing that it's impressionable and conditional. It would be easy to believe the moon is its own light when you only look at what's in front of you. But from a higher perspective, you see the full picture. The moon is not its own light, just as the ego is not the essence. So, um, you know, I talk a lot about karma and, you know, this is um, evolutionary astrology. So there's going to be a lot of talk about karma. Is that better let me see there's an angle in here somewhere i think that's it so um <laughs> so the layers put on by the moon reflected in the personality come from karma the process of working through these karmas, healing the soul and aligning with our essential nature and returning to innocence happens through Scorpio. Um, so just to talk specifically, spend some time talking about karma. Um, karma, the way that I've um, come to understand it, is just simply a collection of false beliefs. It's just... Um, the modification of behaviors, the layers of personality that we put on to interact with our world based on the belief that we're not safe, based on the belief that, that we're not accepted, based on the belief that there's anything wrong with our essence, anything that causes us to carve any of ourselves off with, for the external world um, is coming from a false belief. Because the truth is, um, we're born perfect, <laughs> you know, we come into this, this, this world, our soul is intact, and our essence is, is forged in the furnace of the sun. <laughs> it, the essence is forged in the furnace of, of just divine light. There is nothing that we need to carve off from that. When we come in with that intact and we encounter other people's um, false beliefs, 
you know, it challenges them. They're not okay around us. We, there are things that we trigger in them. Uh, that's theirs, but we don't know that because we're so permeable. Um, so our soul from lifetime to lifetime, um, having experienced things that, um, that cause us to be anything other than our own true divine light, anything that causes us to put on shells to block this light are things that are going to have to be moved through. And at the core of all of them is just simply a false belief. Something bad happens to me um, or something really hard or challenging happens to me. I, um, I take on the belief that I'm not okay. I'm not safe. Any belief that I take on relative to that is going to be something that has to be worked through later. Um, the divine natural order, uh, the, the driving for creative force um, that is there to guide and support us in conjunction with the higher selves is going to create opportunities to challenge that belief so that we can work through it. Uh, for example, if I steal something because I believe that what I have isn't enough, or I, I don't believe that I, I have um, the resources that I need to sustain and, and to, to thrive, um, then later on something is stolen from me. It's not quite sim uh, such a simple cause and effect. It's that something is stolen from me to challenge my belief that, that my worth is defined by what I own. Now I'm going to have stuff taken away from me so that I can see that I, I'm going to find my worth without those things. Um, so it's just simply a, a challenging our false beliefs. So we come into this world imprinting both um, from, from both our ancestors, so that's the IC, and from our own soul. Uh, so we find a family and an early life container that resonates with the karmas we're looking to shift. We pull this from both the, the nodes of the moon and, um, and Pluto acts as a change agent to help us take it on. And we pull this um, also from the IC because the, the moon um, connected to cancer, the cancer is on the IC and the IC is, um, it's, it's early life, but it's also our roots and it's our ancestors. So when we find um, a suitable parent that's going to help us to continue to do the, the, our, our own karmic work and to, um, to fix our own false beliefs, we're going to find a container that reflects those false beliefs back at us so that we can uh, continue, continue to engage them. We're going to find a mother who um, resonates with those false beliefs. We're going to find, and that's how, um, that's how karma is handed down through the ancestries because there's this thread of resonance that we are aligning with, you know, my family, um, resonates with my karmas, you know, so of course my behavior also toward my children is going to continue that thread and my children were born to me because of um, my resonance with their work that they were needing to continue doing and we're all helping each other that way. Um, as we heal something for ourselves, we're healing it for our family. So we're helping to clear up ancestral karmas as we heal it for ourselves and so that's how we can uplift um, not just for us, you know, but for the, for the planet, because these, the karmas from our families are stored in the planet, the planet remembers, you know, it adds to the density of the vibration of mother earth. And so as we continue to do our personal work, we're helping with, um, with the planet as well, so that we can all live here in a much more easeful way. The water Trinity. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, the water signs. It's, you know, Pisces, Cancer, and Scorpio are all the water signs. And um, water has a, a really special job to do for us in our chart in the way that it works with our consciousness. And so depending on um, what sign you're working at it, at it from, you're going to be working on different aspects of this. Um, and I'll explain. I feel too much. So Pisces is the ocean. Um, Pisces is impersonal. Uh, Pisces is the zero point. Um, I, I wrote not 12, <laughs> it's the beginning and the end. So 
the way that we count, you know, like we have, we have 12, um, 12 zodiac signs, we're counting them one through 12. I'm not suggesting we, we go and try to, to change all of that. But for, for my understanding, uh, Pisces is the beginning and the end. It's the place of, it's the zero point energy. It's the place that all, um, all of life is emanating outward from. It's the place of pure potential. It's the soup um, that we all we all come from. It holds all possibility. It's that we what we return to. Um, so as infinity, it holds all. It has no distinction. And Cancer, um, I put semi personal with an apostrophe here, um, suggesting that if if. Um, the apostrophe to remind me to ask you that if anyone can think of a, a better word for this, please let me know. <laughs> I was trying to think semi-personal, hmm, peri-personal? <laughs> I don't, um, it doesn't fe seem like quite the right word for it, but it's kind of like a, a mediator, Pluto being very personal. <laughs> um, but so in the, the womb and in early life, we are still uh, somewhat of the cosmic ocean. We don't have boundaries yet. Um, so lines are blurred between self and other. I put M there also for mother. Um, mother being the ultimate other for us at that time. Um, and us really not knowing the distinction between, between self and other. We don't know that we are not our mother. <laughs> we don't know this. It takes, it takes time for us to really start to draw that distinction. Sometimes forcibly, you know, the terrible twos. Uh, being a time when we start to play with with who am I, what does it mean when I actually have a voice if I'm not my mom. And for some people that journey of I'm not my mom can be lifelong. <laughs> it might, um, that distinction might never happen as much as we try. It's very, uh, it's a very, very deeply woven uh, connection. So we develop beliefs based on childhood conditioning and interface with wor the world as we grow into adulthood based on these beliefs and our emotions. So in cancer, the way that we're working with water, um, there's, there's the, it gets personal, the moon is very personal, but it's us personalizing things that are being reflected back at us. And not everything that's being reflected back at us is of us. And so that's where a lot of uh, conditioning and false beliefs can really set in because it's hard to know um, sometimes what is us and what's not when we're engaging with all of these reflections all the time. And the way that we uh, personalize it, it's, you know, it's nature and nurture where not everyone is going to um, develop the same beliefs based on the situation. We do come in, don't get me wrong, we come in with our essence and based on our essence, we will um, read different things into what's happening and read different meanings into it. But all of the melding and the mixing um, happens in cancer. Uh, Scorpio is personal. So Scorpio is where our soul takes responsibility for guiding us back to our essence and where we are given opportunities to engage our karmas to heal and correct them. Scorpio is how we process our early life conditioning. this. Ah. <laughs> Quarantine 2020, <laughs> making the most. <laughs> um, so Scorpio is where our soul takes responsibility for guiding us to our essence. Um, so we have, we're, in Scorpio, we're given opportunities to engage our karmas, uh, to heal and correct them. And Scorpio is how we process our early life conditioning. Uh, it's psychology and therapy. We spend years and years as adults processing the what and the why of childhood in order to overcome it. Um, overcoming it is our evolution um, or coming back from de-evolution. Um, for, for many, I think this could feel true for a lot of people that um, there, are, there are those that come in with a lot of their essence um, really intact and then they a lot of the karmas that they're picking up is um, is very collective. It's they came come here to work through um, the karmas of the planets more so than um, doing it personally for them. And so you know, bless bless those <laughs> who 
who, who come to take on that big work. Um, and for them, it's just, it's you, and just for, for us and souls in general, you know, with an EA, we talk about what it means to um, come here as a pure soul and um, then go through the process of exhausting desires and then returning back to source, you know, as a pure soul. And essentially, that's just a process of losing ourselves and then finding ourselves again. So it's in there, you know, our higher selves, the, the aspect of the eternal aspect of our soul that's, that's watching all of this play out from lifetime to lifetime uh, doesn't need to evolve. <laughs> um, it's the, and not that they don't um, grow and gain and evolve through it, but what we're working through is just a fraction of, of what uh, that aspect of, or our soul um, has. So uh, from a spiritual perspective, we can come to understand that we shaped our childhood just as much as it shaped us. Um, spending years and years in therapy, you know, going through our childhood, why am I the way that I am? Um, on a spiritual journey, you might find that, um, oh, well, I, I was who I was before childhood. Um, why, the, then the question is, why did I take on this childhood. Uh, but with that said, we don't have to make it all about learning which past life experience or past life karma, et cetera, is at the root of it in order to weed it out. Um, healing from the things we set ourselves up to experience actually weeds it out. Uh, this is why we create these experiences in the first place is to heal. Uh, it doesn't have to be complicated to be effective. Um, and this is a point that I, I feel like is kind of really hard for us to learn that it can be simple whenever something happens and throws you into emotional or spiritual or psychic turmoil um we might spend so much time trying to see if we can dig deeper or deeper or deeper or deeper to get to it when in reality if we just allow ourselves to feel what's there um, if we allow ourselves to just work with it on the level that it's showing up at, we can heal it from there too. So um, that's where I want to get into the emotions. This big body of water is here to represent the emotions um, with the moon being tied to the emotions. So returning to the reflective nature of cancer and the moon. This is true also of our emotions. Through Cancer and the Moon, our emotions act as a bridge for us between the soul and the soup. Um, that is between um, Cancer being between Pisces and Pluto in the water trinity. So the emotions are akin to ripples on the water. Uh, still waters as still water as a perfect mirror reflects things as they are. If we loved our lives um, unconnected, if we lived our lives unconnected from anything, there would be no disturbance. There would be no ripples. Um, through Pisces, we can feel ourselves impacted from things around us. You know, living, going through this world as sensitive beings, we can put on all these filters and all these layers to protect us from the outside world. But the fact is we're still connected to everything. Um, we're still impacted. We, we can try to narrow on what's in front of us. We can try to um, focus on our own journey. Uh, we don't always know what's emotionally impacting us. We don't always know that we're picking up um, things from the person that just walked in the store that we don't feel connected to, but yet, you know, we're picking things up and that, that's coming from Pisces. Um, so this impact can come from empathy, um, can come from engaging, our environment engaging others it can come from interaction it can come from karma or it can come from a calling such as the moon pulls the tides this way or that um, but these are all the ways that our emotional body experiences these um, various types of ripples so our emotions tell us that something has affected us for better or worse our emotions often remind us when a current experience is similar funny I should have put the word current in air quotes or in quotes because that's kind of cute in the context um, but when a, a current experience um, is similar to one that impacted us 
um, our emotions will, will ding, you know, it'll, it'll remember our emotions um, can be, uh, our emotions can be memories. So whatever the case, our emotions translate to us that something needs to be either acknowledged or worked through um, in order, I don't know if anyone's reading along, I've kind of typed this up quickly, um, can be worked through in order to return to still waters. So the place of clarity and peace. Um, working through something, showing up in our emotions, doesn't require a mental process. It's as simple as feeling. On the other end of our letting our emotions process through, we come to the other side with a better sense of what's good for us and can choose um, accordingly. So we can let our emotions do the work for us. Uh, just simply feeling them helps to kind of process things through. Um, imagine um, the difference between being a dam, you know, trying to build dams to deal with something versus just letting something flow. Um, when you're not trying to control water, it will, it will find the, the easiest path. It is always going to go where the easiest path is if you let it. If you're trying to control it or shape it or define it too much, um, then you're, you're working way too hard. Um, when it comes to emotions, they, they know exactly what they need to do. We don't always need to, we don't need to engage our mind. Um, on the other hand though, um, after, if we let them move through, if we let the waters just flow where they need to flow, we often find that the having processed something through emotionally, new insights all of a sudden reveal themselves. Whatever what the disturbance was, whatever the thing was that was impacting us, as it's had the chance to flow through and now release that thing, now we can see more clearly our waters are still again and we have our aha moment about what that was. So the ability to make choices based on the desire for a clear and clean soul is Scorpio. And um, because of karma, we don't start from still waters. Um, our rough waters meet outside impacts and we react emotionally based on our karmic currents. The journey to health and a clear, clean soul through Scorpio and Pluto is the path back to still waters uh, where we can see things, quote, as they are. Notice um, outside impacts as they, happened, as they happen and emotionally process, quote, back to clean and feel the natural currents of our soul um, pulling us toward what is good for us. So um, that's the, our connection to our, to our soul, not just this aspect of our soul in a body having a human experience, but our, our sum, um, our, the soul that is the, the sum total of who we are knows what's good for us and is going to help us on our path. Um, when we can move through enough karma and to get our waters as still as we can and reflect things um, with as much truth as possible, then, um, Scorp then our, through Scorpio and Pluto, we can continue whatever that our journey forward is um, with our, our highest, um, our soul's highest wisdom in mind. Uh, it is, but it is also from the, our soul's higher knowing that things that are put on our path to challenge our beliefs. It's also through our soul's higher knowing that the things that we might cling to, um, a job or a relationship, a hometown, that um, for one reason or another we're clinging to, but that isn't for our highest good, it might hurt. It, it might hurt when that's ripped away or when karma intervenes to have us um, change that thing. It might feel like a loss, you know, Pluto's loss. But it's actually still um, the wisdom of our, our higher soul um, guiding us toward what's, what's better, even if it doesn't feel like it. Um, and always, again, um, such as with the water, it, it'll find its path. Um, it's resistance that creates suffering. It's the resistance to the process that creates the pain. And so um, I had a friend with who made a shirt that was really beautiful, really brilliant. It said, resistance is plutile um, because of the way that um, Pluto is often associated with what we resist. Um, but I found that through the 
hardest and most gut-wrenching parts of, of my life so far um, when I can let go of resistance and when I can allow myself to feel fully what's happening and let those waters find their ground, my, those have been the, the greatest points of evolution. Just unbelievable, um, unbelie they've tr transformed into unbelievably like beautiful experiences. Sad, you know, grief, <laughs> um, pain, fear, and absolute stunning beauty. So it's, it's worth it to um it's worth it to work with pluto <laughs> you know if pluto's wanting you to work with it you just you know you just bow and you say yes okay <laughs> let's do this um i have come to the end of my my notes here and i just want to take a minute to see if there are any questions or any comments, if anybody has any thoughts. I kind of want to take a little bit of a breather before we go to the charts. So <laughs> if anyone has um, just any thoughts or questions or anything, this would be a good time. Impersonal. Oh, thanks, Linda. <laughs> um, and feel free to unmute yourselves when you hear your pretty voices. Well, I just, that was really awesome. I feel like you were describing my life story when you were talking about the moon. <laughs> I know we'll get to my chart later, but um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you, yeah. Yeah. You just like, um, I didn't have a lot of time before this talk to, you know, with homeschooling, homeschooling three kids and wow, wildly different um, demands from their teachers and a lot of wild energy at home. I didn't have time to really slowly build up to the talk and really gather all my thoughts beforehand. I was excited that, um, that this is one where I felt like I didn't have to write everything ahead of time. I felt like I can really talk about this. Um, but this now finally being the chance to talk about it, you know, the time my day I carved out where I could just do this, I'm, I'm just like exploding. <laughs> it's just like, want to make sure it's not too much information. I'm like, <laughs> just like, um, yeah, just letting a lot out. So I want to make sure that it's I'm trying to like pace it, <laughs> make sure it makes a little bit of sense. So that's why I wanted to make sure if there were any questions, if anything needs to be cleared up because um, that was just an explosion of stuff. Um, Prism, we do have yeah. a question from Facebook Live. Okay. Bridget is asking, can you please talk about the moon square Mercury? My entire family has this aspect. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's really going to depend on the chart. And it just sounds like um, Mercury is a big player in the family, you know, especially looking at um, how the moon is connected to the IC and to the ancestors, it would make sense that you guys all have such a common thread. And I would be curious to know how your family communicates. <laughs> um, if you were here talking to me, that might um, be really interested to hear about that, um, how communication works in your family. I bet some of those Mercuries are challenged, you know, some of those may be uh, a little gifted, but that's going to really depend, isn't it? But I'll, if you, um, I'll chat with you after, I'll come over to the little comment section and we can have a conversation if you feel like chiming in on any of those questions that I just asked. So I will switch um, back to sharing here and we can look at some charts. So Debbie, do you want to unmute yourself and <laughs> we can chat? I um, do you know how to unmute yourself? 
I think, is that it now? Yeah, you got it. You got right, it. Great. Thank you. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, I, can I just say that I really yeah. enjoyed everything that you said and I was a bit overwhelmed as to what to, what information to give you, but okay. it was incredible what you were um, describing and explaining about it because it just tapped into so much of my life as well. Oh. And it was, I found it really clear and emotional, <laughs> no surprise there. Yeah. Um, but helpful to thank you yeah oh thank you and <laughs> um and you were kind enough to and I know probably it was pretty last moment you know I reached out to ask about um if there was any information you could give me ahead of time as far as what specifically you were wanting to know and I was grateful you you saw that and, and I was wondering if you could just kind of um, recap for everyone else in your own words, um, not me paraphrasing, but in your own words, um, what you've been experiencing around your moon. Yeah, I am. Um, I suppose I, I volunteered enthusiastically, as Linda said, for this because, you know, it really struck me that I, I have my son in this very busy place in the sixth house in the stellium. And I kind of lived my life in that very kind of busy, non-stop, striving kind of a way and like super helpful. That was, that was what was expected of me as a young child um, by my parents and then I think by my, my husband as well. Mm -hmm. And I never really got a chance to really come into my moon, but um, I was, I was super emotional throughout my life. I had a lot of trauma in my past from the womb, actually, from the very beginning. And just, um, I don't want to go off on a tangent again, but I, there's quite a big ancestral story that I've recently been uncovering as well, very recently. But my mother was actually mentally ill for all of my, all of my growing up. So she was never able to give me she was never prepared to give any information about my childhood, about my birth, about my past. Um, and my mother really thought that I was this, this kind of heaven sent angel that was going to help her in her life because she, she was having such a difficult time. And, you know, I was a sixth house son. I stepped into that role very happily, you know, spent my life emotionally and financially um, supporting my mother um, and it's only in very recent years that I've been able to and it's through astrology as well the last couple of years the wisdom of astrology coming in and evolutionary astrology and I've been able to turn to my Taurus moon to understand and to actually find some peace in myself being being quiet being at home and getting a chance to try and process and heal the experiences that I've had in my life. And, and I have two daughters as well, so that obviously makes it even more, you know, I have to mother, mother them, I have to mother them as children. I, I'm now mothering them as adults. So, mm -hmm. and just to, to finish it, I suppose this, the moon in the sky has always, you know, pulled me <laughs> Like your, like your slide showed, I've just always felt that pull towards the moon in the sky, that need for the feminine somehow. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's yeah. enough or too much. <laughs> perfect, yeah. Um, so, and I, I want to ask you too, when you were caring for your mother, did you feel like you were put on hold? Or do you feel like that there was... Um, should I say, what did you get out of that? What did I get out of that? Yeah. Oh, I really loved my mother. I, I learned how to utterly love someone and, and completely, yeah, they were more important than me. She was more important than I was. Um, and, and she, and, you know, she did love me yeah yeah but she was in such trouble you know that 
I was unprotected, I suppose. I was very unprotected. Yeah. I grew up. I think I had to grow up. I had to, yeah. Big questions. <laughs> yeah, and I wonder if that must have been, that question was maybe a little both too big and vague at the same time. But um, my my sense, my when you're talking too, like it's different when you're reading on a page when you hear someone speaking, when you have your their chart in front of you, but um, the feeling conveyed for me was that that wasn't time set aside or wasted, you know, that, that was, um, that wasn't an abandonment of yourself, even though it'd be really easy to look at that situation and, and feel that a person was robbed, you yeah. know, um, yeah. but there's something about just like a mastery of love and a mastery of service, um, that almost, um, as if that part of your life was, was like an apprenticeship, you know, of mm -hmm. love and service, you know, just a, a part of your training. Your, um, your North node is, is in Leo. So there is definitely, um, uh, your soul is definitely called toward getting to be seen you know, getting to be the, the one in the spotlight, getting to be shiny. Yes. <laughs> I see that. <laughs> um, but yeah. Yeah, so you're not meant to, to hide behind service, you know. But the back to the moon, um, I think you had said something when you, you messaged me, you had said something about... Um, uh, Oh, now I kind of wish I'd copied the words, but it had to do with um, being pulled to it in a way that what it felt like you were describing the way you're being pulled to it, being like really connected to Taurus, you know, like that, that deep nurturing sustenance, like really connecting to it, like an, like an anchor, yeah. um, the Taurus being like a really, really grounded energy. Um, but the I, I want to point out to you, and I, I don't know how familiar you are with the asteroids. Um, Very much, I love them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a few things to point out um, in your chart, and I'll start there. The, your moon is uh, conjunct Vesta and Ceres, mm -hmm. and um, and Ceres really is kind of, is connected to to nurturing, you know, mm -hmm. to um, our sustenance, um, abundance. Uh, the Vesta is. Uh, it's a really powerful one. It's the Vestal Virgins. It's connected to the Vestal Virgins who they, um, their lives were built around service in a way that was um, just all about maintaining their own purity. Um, there were, it was their, uh, there were virgins who uh, committed um, from childhood, committed their lives to maintaining the sacred fire um, at the, the temple. And, um, and so they had to stay pure, um, and it was a it was a big, just a really big duty. Um, like basically, like their their lives were built around like this ultimate service. And so your moon being connected to those things, um, it it feels like there's can be like such an anchor to that, especially in in early life. You know, with with moon being so connected to early childhood, uh, but your moon is also um, intercepted. And which means that it's not actually being ruled. Um, it's not in a house that is being ruled by by a sign. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Um, it's in Taurus, but so another way to say that is it's in Taurus, but you see that Taurus um, doesn't rule your house because it has to be on on the cusp of the house, the beginning of the house, in order to rule it. Yeah. Um, and so when you have a sign that's enclosed entirely within the walls of a house, it's called being intercepted and it cuts you off from aspects of that energy um, in some cases. Uh -huh. um, and in some cases, it, it can also be that it's just so well developed that it doesn't need um, to be in a house that's ruled by that sign. Um, mm -hmm. And that there are other things, um, other areas that are focused, um, a focus for development. 
and which what you what you look at, at for that is the the signs that are ruling two houses and in general when something is intercepted you um typically the the that means that that energy is not available um ea is one of the astrology paradigms that that really do make concessions for you know looking at how developed the soul is in your case i would say definitely like this is an area that's just so well developed you know um mm -hmm. that you that area that area is not blocked for you um mm -hmm. but it is pointing to other areas where that is um you need to focus on that act uh, being able to act that out um that expression out uh, you look at what is ruling that planet um so in this case um taurus ruling it it's ruled by venus and so you see when it comes to this energy venus is an, an even greater player than than usual you're gonna look at the ruler for what's ruling that planet anyway um but in an interception sometimes that's the only way to access those energies and in your case again i don't think that that applies um i think it's a it's an overdeveloped sign <laughs> um but but we still want to look at venus um and then we find venus is in in um the sixth house which is again you know service yeah. um but with being sagittarius um it, it tells me that that when it comes to service you're able to act based on knowing what is nurturing um actually truly having a sense um from a higher perspective what is going to help another um uh, um but there is okay give me just a second so just getting out of my head with it there is another piece that felt relevant um when i was getting the sense that helping your mom wasn't necessarily abandoning yourself that there is something about um your relationship um, to yourself through service that felt a little bit harder to touch directly. And so it's easier to channel that into another person. So in a way that she became a vehicle for you to do some personal work that by helping her, you were helping yourself, it was more indirect. And mm -hmm. so that's where the, um, that's where the um, interception feels, it feels relevant in that sense that it's well developed but a little maybe a little bit too painful to touch too directly mm -hmm. and so your mother giving you a way to do that work a little bit indirectly um it's also square the nodes and so that means that while it's well developed it's been a little, little bit developed in a way that has um not been perfect it's left some pieces undone when you see something squaring the nodes um it means that it's connected to your past um it's connected to something that um in ea that we call a skip step yeah and so something that has to be resolved um you haven't uh, in the ways that you've been doing it um there's been excuse me um you've been searching for some piece to perfect or some piece to complete in that that needs to be um better understood and when you're looking for how to resolve a skip step um, you know that it's connected to, so it's connected to the nodes, it's connected to both, it squares both the north and the south node. Um, so you started doing this, you went into your north node with this, uh, maybe a little bit too soon or in a way that didn't uh, tidy up things from the past. And so when you want to resolve it, you want to look at which node to resolve it through. Either you need to focus on like just doing it in a way that f fully honors your north node or in a way that goes back and revisits your south node. Yeah. And the way the way that you find that is whichever notice um, to the left of it is if you were standing on the outside of your chart, yeah. um, looking in um, from the position of the moon, being the that that's where your um, skip step is, where the square is to the nodes. So if you're on the moon, looking at your nodes, the one to the left, your south node. Mm -hmm. And so your south node is in a, um, an Aquarius in the eighth house. And that south node is really, really trying to get your attention because it's in a, it's, it's in a sign that rolls double. Because you see your, um, yeah. your Aquarius is rolling two houses. Yeah. 
so it's a major player. And so when you have um, an inter something that's intercepted um, and, and a sign that's not ruling any houses, that means that there are signs in your chart that are ruling two houses. And those ones are gonna be very dominant. Um, being that it's an Aquarius um, in the eighth house, the, the invitation is to really, really make sure that all of your actions when you're in, acting in service are rooted in what's really authentic to you. It's easy to look at, um, for you, it's really easy to pick up on what's going to be best for someone else. And, um, and especially if you see, if you notice that, that Neptune is also squaring your nodes and opposing that moon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so Neptune is, um, uh, it's, you know, and it's in Scorpio. So again, like kind of continuing with that, that Scorpio energy being a soft note is in the eighth house, you know, it's trying to really bring your attention back to like, yeah, but maybe look a little bit deeper because, you know, Venus makes it really, your Venus in uh, Sagittarius, Sagittarius is a bigger picture. It's connected to, um, more of like the divine natural order that is um, whatever um, whatever is going to be for someone's best and highest good. You're really good at seeing that for someone else. Um, but with your, your Neptune creates kind of blurry boundaries between self and other, which is why it's easier for you to do some of your work on your mother, mm -hmm. um, you know, and see her as the vehicle for, for what you're needing in some ways. Like if you can help her, maybe trying to help yourself through that. Um, but that's not working. That was, that wasn't, um, the solution. The solution that you're being pulled toward now is making sure that your service is first and foremost authentic with self, um, back with the South node in Aquarius. It's all about authenticity uh, okay. and, um, yeah. And it's all about, um, you know, in Scorpio, it's that, is this what's true for my soul, you know, and it can be true for another and not be true for you. Excuse me, Susan. Um, we've only got two minutes left in this meeting, so I'm going uh -huh. to ask. I'm used, sorry, I'm I'm used to you, um, lately, you've been saying. Don't worry about the time. Two more volunteers in, so um, okay. Yeah, thank you. Got it. So having too much fun. <laughs> wow. That's but that thank covers you. that covers the basis. Your thank your you. Neptune is really needing to, in his fifth house again, needing to be resolved through. Leo, um, um, you're in your North Node. So you're looking at how to take that, um, that Neptunian energy um, and apply that to your North Node uh, and then taking that, that Moon energy and applying it to your South Node. It has to be authentic, um, but the Neptune in the fifth house, like, like yes, you can tune in to spirit, you know, you could say, you can tune into something bigger, something higher, but then you've got to pull yourself, um, source yourself from that. Yourself yeah. has to come, um, you need to be resolving that through the North Node and making sure that, that you're able to find what you need through that so that you can, you can really step forward and shine. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> really amazing. Um, it makes so much sense and, I don't know, I take confidence from, from hearing you say it. Okay. Um, the, yeah, the big piece that I didn't know was that Aquarius was so much about authenticity. That was really helpful to hear. So okay. that's really wonderful. All right, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Yeah. So. Thank you for giving that so much time. <gasps> and, and I just want to ask um, between um, Anjali and um, I'm not seeing everyone's names in front of me. Let's see, yeah, and um, Amila. So, are there I, are either of you uh, more restricted than the other? I just want to check in with both of you and make sure if I should put one of you um, first, depending on if someone's going to need to go. And I'm let me totally know. flexible. Okay, all right. I appreciate that. So then, Amila, are you available right now? Are you ready? Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. Am I saying your name right? Uh, it's Amila. It's really unusual. It's okay. okay. Yeah. It's good that I asked. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
So actually, oh, go ahead. No, what, so do you have a question for me? Um, I would just be interested in hearing, again, just like in your own words, I guess, how you've been experiencing your moon, what it is that you're looking for um, understanding better. Sure, well, I'll just try to keep it um, brief, but you know, um, you know, my child self was just so highly aware of everyone's emotional state around me and mm -hmm. the state of the world, you know, Cancer Moon, um, Pisces rising. And um, I think I felt kind of responsible and it kind of really just dropped into the mothering role really early in my life and became a mother pretty young as well. And um, <laughs> sorry, I'm gonna. Yeah, yeah that's okay. You know, carry. <laughs> people come very naturally to myself and um i th think you know uh, um i hope that um i just want to pause you for a second because your voice is like lately, yeah, really been learning the last couple of years. I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna I don't know if you can hear me. nourish my son to more. Can you hear me now? Amela, uh, Amela, um, your connection is very unstable and you're cutting in and out. So let's let Prism respond to what you have, what she has been able to hear. Um, I just, I had a hard time making it out. So I just want to double check. All I was able to get was that you came in with that um, sense of um, supporting and nourishing others very intact. Is that accurate? I, I cut out, but I think I'm back. Yeah, I, I don't, I didn't hear that, but that's, that's okay. I, <laughs> so I think my under, my internet cut out. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, it seems like we're back though. And so I just wanted to double check. Um, so you're saying that you came in with a sense of um, how to connect with and, and nurture others and what other needs that, that you came with that intact? In yeah, life? definitely. Yeah. Okay. Um, how did you experience that in your environment in your early childhood? Oh, uh, well, I mean, I think I really enjoyed caring for other people and um but I think I didn't realize the importance of caring for myself as much at the same time like it was really easy for me just to you know it was kind of almost felt like caring for other people was caring for myself um mm -hmm. which it is to an extent but you know then there's also sometimes you need to take yeah time for yourself and um, nourish yourself so I think that's something I've really been learning a lot about in the last couple of years in particular Mm -hmm. um, but I think because I was so focused on taking care of other people when I was younger, I think I didn't explore my own creative potential as much as I could have. And so I think that's something that I'm starting to do now. And I think, I guess that's really, I'm really curious if you have any insights for me as far as just anything that would be helpful as far as kind of really tapping into that creative well in myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, I mean, <clears throat> your son is at the be beginning degrees of Taurus, you know, um, mm -hmm. zero degrees, that's a very yeah. new energy. Uh, so it, it seems that your creative potential is, um, it's at a place of such um, possibility that it might be hard to know where to start, you know, that... It Definitely feels that way sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and just to, to come back to the moon, and I, I can say more about that uh, potentially too, but just to come back to the moon, it, it is squared um, Mercury in mm -hmm. Aries. And so I wonder if there's um, ways that you might have stifled your communication to be more pleasing. I'm noticing Pluto and Libra as well. And both of those things are squaring your moon. And so um, in your, the way that you've been able to, to really support others, have there been ways in which um, 
you maybe have chosen what's pleasing um, over what would be more, um, do you find sometimes you default to what would be more pleasing? Yeah, especially, you know, my younger self, I was like, I could tell what would be good for other people, especially, you know, my family members. And so I would choose that and kind of say what would support that instead of sometimes maybe voicing what it might have been better for myself. Yeah. Um, and I think that has played out kind of in some of my relationships as an adult, but I feel like that's something that I've been aware of for years. And I, I feel like I'm really learning how to speak my truth in an appropriate way instead of just going with the flow. Um, yeah. and, and that nurturing side also, it's like, well, you know, I mean, this, that, you know, you know, it's like, it's easy for me to be able to cater to someone else's needs or desires. Um, but I think I have gotten a lot stronger about staying actually connected with my own needs and desires and then being able to voice them. Yeah. Um, but that certainly has been a challenge for me. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, what do you fear will happen if you voice your truth in a way that is, that other people don't find, that doesn't accommodate them? Gosh, I mean, I think, I think my child self was afraid that people wouldn't like me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but my adult self now, like I said, it's like, I've been finding more comfort with it and I, you know, really learning how to stand in my truth because, you know, if I'm not standing in my truth, I'm not really serving anyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and in a way, it's almost like not trusting other people to be able to handle the truth. Hmm. You know, it, we okay. might not, we might be stifling other people's evolution if we go toward what is least challenging, you yeah. know it's not helping, it's not helping the situation grow. Yeah. Um, it's not helping us grow or them. It's kind of keeping, it's like, um, it's kind of like bringing things to the lowest common denominator. Yeah. Um, so it can feel pleasant, but then, um, right. There's no tension and there's no growth. Yeah. It can be. Yeah. Um, and something that I was talking about earlier in the talk too, that there's this, um, that it can be easy to, um, but so if we're able to kind of deal with what's in front of us, like actually like let it happen, mm -hmm. um, we don't have to overthink it. We don't have to make a ton of uh, concessions or accommodations for it. We can just kind of let it be. And like I said, with, like with letting water find, find the ground, find its ground, it'll find the, the path that it needs to take. Um, when, we, um, when we don't speak our truths, sometimes um, when we're trying to do what feels easier, but we're not allowing um, what, what is to, to really get to be there and acknowledging it and honoring that, then this is something um, that we will experience from Pluto is that it'll get louder. Uh -huh. And whatever that challenge is, um, if we don't let that, those small challenges happen, they become big challenges. Uh -huh. And the voice of Pluto, like it, It'll, if it's trying to get your attention and put something in your path, you know, challenge you and you don't accept it, you just like, I'm just going to sidestep that. Then it puts something bigger in your path, you know, and it starts to kind of shout at you. Maybe it gets a little louder until, um, until it'll do whatever it takes to reach you. And it, it's, it might be that we don't start to listen to something or we don't take it on until it becomes a big deal. And so um, that's just a big caution that I see uh, in your chart, especially with communication, um, squaring, squaring your moon and with Pluto being in Libra in the eighth house that, um, you know, Pluto and Libra is a generational thing. Um, I'm Pluto and Libra. My husband is, we definitely experience overlap there, but then we experience it very differently depending on what house it's in. Um, being in the eighth house, that there is something um, there's so much deeper you can go when you are able to speak your truth. Um, there's, there's a lot that you're shutting yourself off from. Um, and as far as the ways that your soul can really evolve into itself, um, Pluto really wants to bring out like in the eighth house, you know, it really wants to look at stuff. And, um, and if you're not really um, able to really look at it or go into some 
pretty places, you're going to be shutting yourself off from a, a lot of your evolution. Uh, and, you know, I say that <laughs> also noticing that you have all this, this really beautiful evolution that I see just kind of built into your chart. You know, mm -hmm. I don't see this chart being like a soul who's just like living in turmoil and struggling and not listening. <laughs> Um, I just see someone who's, uh, I see the, the Jupiter and Mars on your North node. Mm -hmm. Um, whenever you have planets on a node like that, especially on the North nodes, those, those, um, are gifts. If it's on the South node, it can be that, um, uh, sometimes it's, there's something hard we have to relive to access something we've learned before, but it, the, that Jupiter and Mars hanging on your North node, um, show that you really do have a, a knack uh, for aligning um, aligning your intentions mm -hmm. in a very pure way. Um, yeah, and that's, um, it's slightly um, aspecting that, that moon. It's, I mean, it's the nodes of the moon, it's connected. You know, it's, it's very much connected. It shows that the, the work that you're here to do, you're not here to create a lot of disharmony, you know, but there is a call toward finding, um, finding more balance uh libra is about balance so um so the stuff that you're experiencing with your moon uh pluto wants to make sure uh is challenging you to make sure that you really are finding the balance between um what is going to be accommodating versus what's going what's going to make you grow or help others to grow you know like what are you accommodating are you accommodating um like if you're accommodating for someone that allows them to not be their best selves, you know, um, are you accommodating, um, if somebody's can get triggered, you know, um, by something that they've experienced and you, and the most, with the most loving intentions decide not to, uh, challenge them, you don't want to trigger them, you know, that can feel like the loving choice, but, then they never get to own their triggers. They never get to work through it. They don't get to grow. Yeah. So I mean, I think, I mean, I think, I think that I'm, I really, I'm not as challenged with this aspect as I used to be. Like, I think mm -hmm. I've really been growing into my voice and standing in my truth and sharing my truth. And I, but I really see like that aspect played out a lot in my younger self to bring me to the place that I am now. Um, and I think it's, really important for me to keep that awareness of right to speak speak the hard things and have those hard conversations because it's really in everyone's yeah greater good to 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 bring things out up, up and talk about them yeah. yeah i mean you're you're already naming it you know i'm i'm kind of yeah. going to it the chart for the group my i don't think that you're you know this is the newest of information for you um but you do have uh, Uranus squaring the nodes. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit of a loose square, but it's a square and it's in, um, it's in Scorpio in the ninth house. And so, um, you know, Uranus is that, that change agent. Um, yeah. It's, it's a uh, call toward authenticity. Mm -hmm. It wants to, it wants you to find um, that there's, there are things available to you um, when you are your absolute most authentic self, there, mm -hmm. there, are, there are new things that become available to you uh, through that process. And so, um, and in your case, the, the square is resolved through the, the North Node. Mm -hmm. and, and so you, when you run into challenges around, um, am, I act, am I acting from what, what is my truth right now? If you find that you've, you, the answer to that ever is that you're choosing something based on um, not your truth, you know, based on um, being pleasing or accommodating or any kind of conditioning toward nurturing or service, um, that's the moment to take pause and realign with, okay, um, what does it mean to really first and foremost honor what is, what's authentic for me right now? Is it authentic to give this? Is it authentic to do this thing for that person? Am I taking for myself to do it? Mm -hmm. um, and being willing to, to, to step into um, new actions based on, on those answers. And um, we might sometimes be responding from conditioning 
when we're conditioned from such a loving place, it is easy to confuse that for the truth. Yeah. Because, you know, it's loving. How could that not be the truth? Um, and it doesn't have to be a but like, oh, it's loving, but it's conditioning. So it doesn't count. It's an, it's an and like, yes, that's loving. And there's a lot of truth in that. And there's, there's more here, you know, there's mm. opportunity to look deeper. And that's the, that's the Pluto for you. And um, that's uh, squaring your moon. It's, it's, this, it's an and like you, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to argue with the truth in um, loving kindness you know um but there there's some additional factors is all to look at mm -hmm. and to make sure that you're channeling um those you're comparing what's true for you right now um you're channeling that through your north node so that when you are acting in service um it's as a, as a greater service to um when you're acting in in your truth that that service can be, it can go deeper, it can reach more deeply, it can, it can help more deeply. Mm -hmm. um, did you have any other questions or uh, is, does that all sound? Like yeah, that really all resonates a lot. So thank you so much. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Did it give you what you need? I, I mean, I think so. I, I think, I mean, I think really that communication piece is so crucial. It's how we connect and, you know, evolve together in our relationships. And, um, and I think too, just you saying that about the creativity thing, sometimes I don't know where to start because there's so many things that I'd love to yeah. do and get into. And it's like, there's only so much time in the day. Yeah. 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 Well, again, yeah, the, the whole piece about, like the sun the connection between the sun and the moon you know and the moon is reflecting this essence of the sun um if you the more time that you spend um in reflecting having other people's needs reflected back at you you know it, it does create distortions mm -hmm. it does it does create a, it displaces some of that some of your own life that you actually need for your creativity um and so if you're looking at the sun in your chart and what, what is being expressed about your essence um, from your sun and the, its placement, um, it, there's a lot of nourishment for you in the creative process. Mm -hmm. And what it looks like to not just like creativity, Leo as art, but Leo as like how we create our lives. Mm -hmm um there's there's a lot of nourishment for you there um and i think that's what's you know digging kind of the what's underneath is going to help you open up to you know pluto is trying to kind of clear the way toward um yeah because it's in the it's in the second house you mm -hmm. know pluto's in the eighth house and so um spending some time really looking at that access you know and how they balance each other out um, and I, I, I do a talk on, um, I think it was called Harmony of the Spheres, where I really look at the individual signs um, uh, that are in natural opposition, opposition to each other in the yeah. chart. And even just or looking up more information on that could be really helpful for you. Um, those two things are, you know, there's, they're helping to balance each other out. And that's what Pluto wants is balance. It's in Libra. It's all about coming back to balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Prisma. Yeah. Thank, yeah. You. Thank you for yeah. your time and your um and all of your heart and willingness to 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 engage. Thank you so much. Well I hope I hope it was helpful for for everyone watching too. Mm -hmm. So then Anjali. Hello, Prism. See you on your iPad. <laughs> Yes, we have an iPad. You know, where I've got my iPad set up, it's not aesthetically pleasing to be on camera. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, so um, I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, my background is in Indian astrology. I'm totally new to evolutionary astrology. Mm -hmm. uh, in Vedic astrology, I've got a challenging moon. Mm -hmm. And the day that Saturn and Pluto went conjunct, I think it was January 12th, I got noticed that I had to move out of my home and we got 60 days notice, moved out of state, 
everything quick, quick. I understand astrologically why it happened, but um, I've really gone through a, a grieving process. Mm -hmm. I loved what you said about not having to figure things out and to just feel it. Mm -hmm. Because lately, that's kind of what I do. I just, I know that I, I have to feel all the feels. I have to grieve. I have to get upset, depressed, and then I'm done. Mm -hmm. You know, move past it. Um, but I've really taken this time of, you know, being down with the virus and everything to do, uh, to explore deeper shadow work. Mm -hmm. And I know that that's what I'm being called to do. Uh, I also have some womb trauma. I was given up for adoption at birth. Uh, so that's been an, an issue in my life. But I'd really be interesting to, to hear uh, the perspective of evolutionary astrology and my moon. Okay. That makes um, sense. <laughs> what was that? Did that make sense? I was trying to hurry. <laughs> oh, no, uh, it does. It absolutely makes sense. Um, and I, I, I appreciate your time. If you have the time, I don't want you to worry about hurrying. Um, yeah, okay. I, I, I totally have the that. time if they feel like they have to go at any point. But Okay, thank you. Yeah, I am. Um, your, your moon is got a lot of a lot of asteroid bodies next to it it's it's very very conjuncted and um, in, in the neptune there it's it looks like you came in with so much um energy and what a what a trip to not be able to look at your mother and know what that is you know mm -hmm. to not be able to um to see what all she's been passing on to you to have to do that kind of work in the dark. You know, that's a special kind of work. Yeah, I actually was reunited with her 25 years ago and meeting her was sort of the catalyst to my spiritual awakening. Um, mm -hmm. She turned me on to Reiki and just all sorts of things. It really triggered a lot of wonderful things in my life. That's brilliant. Oh, I'm, I'm glad to hear it, but that's been helpful. Um, and your Pluto also being conjunct to Neptune. Um, let's see. I, I put some notes here. Okay, cool. Um, I put a little, um, I wanted to remind myself that you had a background in Vedic astrology and, um, and you're talking about it being not in a very auspicious place in Vedic. And I, I studied Vedic, um, and I, I've taken courses and trained in it, but I really parted ways with the whole concept of there being an, a negative placement, of okay. there being anything inherently negative. Um, not to poo-poo the idea of anything being hard, like not at all, you know. Right. I, um, if I... Um, I don't want to offend or insult anyone to suggest that something happening um, to them uh, wouldn't be painful. But this, I feel like the, the solutions are in the chart. And, mm -hmm. um, and that also it's just that we have to trust the wisdom of what we were set up to experience. You know, we, it'll be really great to just be here in a very, um, in a very beautiful, harmonious way where we don't have to be challenged by anything, but, but the, the obstacles that are put on our path or the things that, are, that do challenge us, they're, they're supposed to get us to that. Um, so it's just a matter of knowing how to work with the energies. Um, and, I, and I wanted to say too, as far as Vedic versus um, evolutionary astrology, uh, the way that I see that is um, it's just a different paradigm. You know, or as Vedic versus uh, evolutionary versus Western astrology, you know, they draw the houses differently. You will, if I'm looking at my chart from Western astrology, my son is literally in a different house, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, so the, the argument around like which one is true, is the, there's no argument there. They're all true. It's just different, different paradigms. Your, whatever paradigm you're attracted to is going to give you the information that you need um, relative to um, relative to that, that paradigm. And with evolutionary astrology, it's, it looks at what's deeper, you know, it looks at the why. Um, and I, I put, 
I put it out for myself said let's talk 5d <laughs> um, yes <laughs> yeah. um because what you're saying is, is perfect it's and all of that moon energy in Scorpio like you're exactly right like just not having to know the why and just feel it um evolutionary astrology can be a lot of fun when it comes to playing with the why you know oh well this lifetime or you know these karmas or that you know it's an endless amount of um fun that you can you can do you can geek out on soul work you know with with ba um but you want to be careful about um making it all about this information or that information um the chart is a us honestly kind of a blueprint for for showing you just what is um and just showing you what is can be enough um letting and allowing what is can be enough um because if as you allow what is to be there um and just deepen into what what is like right now right now um we're in lockdown right now my kids are home and driving me crazy you know um just like i right now i i lost my i lost my income at the start of all of this and whenever i start reaching for a reason um then that's when you start to create karma anytime you're trying to to explain it to explain it to yourself too quickly or look for meaning oh it's for this that's why or i'm supposed to do this or spirit's knocking me in this direction you know uh, whenever, anytime something is like taken away from you, um, and I'm acknowledging the, the move you said you recently, um, had to move, anytime something is taken away from you like that, um, it's easy to want to replace it with something or replace it with meaning. Um, yeah. and when you're just like sitting with what is, it's like, what is, is, um, this was sad for me, you know, I'm grieving this loss. Um, what is, is, you know, we're stuck at home right now. What is, is I'm kind of interested in learning more about the ocean, you know, or just whatever is coming up, just allowing that, um, and just being present with, with what's, um, with what's showing up. You can do some deep, deep work from that place. Um, and for you, like the, the moon being so heavily aspected, um, and you're, you said, I believe you said that you've had, uh, you have deep feelings. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a gift, you know, just uh, being able to say what is right now is that I'm feeling really sad. Um, that move stuff that you don't even have to know what it is. All of a sudden, the next day, what is, is totally different. The next day, right. what is, is shaped, is shaped in an entirely different way. New opportunities are showing up and you don't have to know why. It was just that you had to get really, really sad, you know, for a day. Or you yeah, it's only recently that I've been doing that. You know, before I would have to spin out the reasons and the thinking and get into my intellect. And, and it's only recently that I've learned that about myself. And I just, I have to grieve. And I, I grieved for a month. And now I'm done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, that's just what's true. You know, you can't repress it. Um, and you've got Pluto and Uranus in the fourth house. And so connecting you to the cancer, again, fourth house being connected to the, the cancer energy um, and on your IC. So there are things that are going to be pulled up for you, um, things that are pulled up from your ancestors um, on being on the IC, things that are being pulled up from you connected to like the way that your ancestry, your DNA is, is through your DNA is like connected connecting you to past life stuff um and uranus being there it's so so much of it is about just being real you know uranus again is that authenticity your feelings are going to get you in touch with what's real over and over and over again your feelings are going to take you there and as soon as you try to explain it to yourself or define it um you run the risk of defining it from karma you run the risk of defining it from from limiting limited beliefs and it becomes less real you know this when there's a, sh a kind of there's like a sheen to a feeling when it's real you can feel the sheen to it you can feel the truth in it it's more vibrant 
And as soon as your head starts coming up with reasons, um, then that you'll feel that sheen kind of dull and you know that you're moving into story and you're limiting what's possible. Um, when you, and this is me, let's talk 5D, you know, um, 5D, air quotes. Yeah. Um, but when you um, are really allowing yourself those extra dimensions, when you're working with all of the Ds, it doesn't, it doesn't always drive with your story. It doesn't drive with what you might tell yourself about what's happening. It's connecting you to something, um, something down the pipeline that has a certain feeling to it that you can't explain or you might not even be able to identify yet and all of the things that are happening in your life now are um the necessary things that you have to feel um in order to get closer and closer to that feeling um and your emotions know what is blocking you up your emotions know what's in the way um, your emotions know when there's a disturbance something that some outside force is influencing you um, that you need to move past its influence, um, feeling your way through that is, and actually doing it without dulling those feelings with stories is going to be, is going to be the, the fastest path every single time. Um, and your sun being on your south node in Capricorn, um, a lot of, just a lot of earth energy there in your south node, uh, just being really grounded. So in your north node in Cancer, um it just seems like you are inherently a grounded person you know correct me if i'm wrong no you're right yeah yeah and so you have everything that you need to really stay anchored and not lose yourself in the emotion of anything um so that you can really do that north node um in cancer it's it's in the the first house and so that north node is it it wants to be done so badly because anything that is in your first house is, shows up in your life in a big way. Like you can't really sidestep it. Um, so you're, you're set up to really, um, and all, so many gifts on your South node, so many, so many things that you've developed so much. Um, I would say not all of those are probably felt like gifts right away, you know, probably some, um, some things that have to be revisited or relived when you see something on your south node um it's either just a straight gift or there's a revisit relive dynamic that gets you on your way to accessing the gifts of that fully um so capricorn um and no, i wrote an article recently about um saturn on my website that i like i find myself wanting to quote these things i could point you at it if you're ever interested in looking into that more but oh yeah definitely yeah but I explain how um Saturn and its divine nature Capricorn you know Saturn is a divine expression it's actually meant to be able to have um to update it's a cardinal mm -hmm. sign um it's okay with change it's just us clinging to not wanting things to change that <laughs> create a lot of problems um and so when if you experience things where you feel like you're clinging to something where it's like no I want to be grounded I want to know what's what you know I want to um, know what this is or that is or my environment is so that I can feel st stable and steady um, you're gonna be you're gonna run into some some problems because um, because let me see Okay, look. Okay, Pluto's. I want to say, I'm oh, sorry, Linda. Pluto. You this. And yeah. Perhaps you could contact um, yeah. Anjali and continue this. We've gone over time for about five minutes. Okay. Um, we must wind it down now. Okay, so, I got it. Thank you, everybody. We'll catch you next time. Thank you it's very Pluto. much.